The final speaker of our session is Johannes Eichstadt. He is from Stanford, and he will be talking about what can we learn from Twitter analysis about COVID-19. Hello, everyone. My name is Johannes Eichstadt. I just joined the Stanford faculty. I am a psychologist, and I specialize in using social media to understand the psychological states of large populations. And today, what I thought I'd do first is to zoom out a little bit after so much disease focus to try to capture a little bit of the psychological impact that might be coming out of the way. So if we think about the COVID-19 outbreak and everything that happened around the outbreak, the social distancing, there's probably three main things that are going on. Right now, we are all going through a phase of uncertainty and anxiety. This, was, this came up in previous talks. There's an acute adjustment phase where we're engaging in information searches um, that serve both informational and psychological needs in our sense-making processes. This is an acute adaptation process. Then there's going to be a real low hierarchy of needs impact on a large part of the population. That's unemployment. There's a huge unemployment shock. And then there might be um, the biggest transition in social norms, rituals, and behaviors since World War II coming out of way, uh, coming our way as we're transitioning from face-to-face -face interaction um, to the digital space. Um, humans are a fundamentally social species. A large part of our neural infrastructure is dedicated towards tracking other people, body language, human contact. We regulate our emotions better through other people than basically any other way. And we're now seeing a natural disaster unfolding in slow motion with an absolutely unpredictable impact uh, long-term on our psychological adaptation. I think that's fair to say. So I think that there is a good chance that all three of what we call pathways will lead to reduced subjective well-being and mental illness. So just, just a quick check-in on the unemployment. I mean, many of you, I presume, have seen this. Um, this is data from the US. Um, the gray area there is um, the Great Recession 2008-2010 spikes in unemployment up to 300,000 per week. This is just what happened last week, 3.3 million on a new unemployment claims. This is a, a shock to the labor market that we have not seen since World War II. Um, so what do we know about the psychological literature of unemployment? So here's a, here's a famous study about 24,000 Germans that have gone through unemployment. And you see that they go from the baseline. Um, you see two years before unemployment and then unemployment happens at the zero line here and their life satisfaction, which is the sort of one of the key variables of, of subjective well-being, drops by 0.7. Okay, what is 0.7 on a 10-point scale? Doesn't seem like that much. Here's, here's context. So here are national rankings of life satisfaction, which is heavily dependent on income and education and all the things we value in society. And going 0.7 down in, in these statistics would go, I mean, would mean going from the United States to Slovakia or Uzbekistan. That is just the impact of unemployment. So if we go back to this model and we just think about this pathway here, it is huge. What about loneliness, this, this piece down here? Well, this is a study of 700,000 people. Um, there, the impact of loneliness is 0.5, so almost as much as unemployment. And it's comparable to the impact of suffering from headaches or being chronically ill. That's also big. So if you look at this whole model, right, this pathway is big. This pathway is big. Um, what's the, how lonely are we going to get as a function of this, of this outbreak? I think that's up to us. That's up to us, uh, to our ability to, to transition into the social, uh, the digital social spaces beyond FaceTime, find new ways of belonging and connecting in the digital space. And finally, the uncertainty anxiety piece. Um, that's hard to predict. So if nothing else, um, we as social scientists, we as people who care about the public health of the population, need to measure the well-being of the population at scale uh, now more than ever. How, we, how might we be able to do this? Well, um, my colleagues and I for now 10 years have worked on methods of using Twitter to um, read the language of communities across the U.S. and across other countries in the world and um, create well-being estimates, and we're doing that now, and we're going to try to make that data available as quickly as we can to the entire research community so we can start figuring out how our psychological experience is changing now that our biological experience has, has suffered this impact. 
So we're collecting fresh data. But what can we learn from Twitter in the meanwhile? And this data is fresh. Uh, it's still warm. Uh, what we did here um, over the last months is um, scrape Twitter for hashtags, clean it, throw out replies and retweets. Then we extracted something called topics, which are these clusters of um, uh, coherent words. I'll show you what those are in a second. And then we combine it with other things that we knew about counties, including the, the cases and the confirmed deaths and everything we know about the census and who lives in these counties. And then we just looked in this data space of what kind of connections can we see and how people talk about the disease and what these communities are structured like. So the first thing here that I'm showing you is what's going on right now in urban counties across the US, right? So this is, this is probably wherever you're watching from, this is probably where you're watching from. Um, so you see a lot of this adaptation. So all these clusters are little pieces of language that uh, COVID related language that hang together. So these things are all um, significantly correlated with living in urban areas. And you can see this adjustment to COVID lifestyle from not touching your face to there's panic buying and toilet paper here in the middle. Um, to things being canceled and working from home. In a sense, this is, the, this, is, this is the adjustment, right? Just the functional adjustment. If we look at this slightly differently and we, we look at this data by education, we see that educated areas are very information seeking and information processing. So there's a lot of talking about articles and news. There's, of course, things that will be canceled in the future, like conferences or move to the digital. This talking about testing, about healthcare, and about government reaction. So this is high One level meaning making and information integration. How does this look like by age? Well, in older, country, in older counties across the US, there's talk about Trump um, and about the economic impact. Um, whereas in younger counties, this is much more problem focused coping. This is the, the one language cluster that stands out there is that in counties that are younger, people talk about washing their hands. And finally, if we actually look at who voted for Trump in the, uh, among the counties, the, the one piece of language that stands out there is this, um, it's just like the flu. It's the sort of downplaying conspiracy talk. And we're, uh, we're, we're starting new research now where we see how this sort of misinformation decays. Presumably, everybody is being slowly ramped up onto the same reality. Um, and finally, what do people feel most negatively about right now on Twitter? Uh, they feel scared, they feel negative about the economy, and then there's a huge cluster of feeling negatively about Trump. So here are my very quick takeaways. We really need to measure the well-being impact of COVID, both the entire distribution of, of risk, well-adjusted people, people who are in danger of mental illness, and we very quickly need to think about scalable mental health care. And now is the time um, to mobilize resources to make that happen. Um, we see sign of COVID adjustment in urban educated communities. We don't yet see it in rural areas. I think that's coming. The biggest predictor right now of COVID cases is still population density. So that makes sense. So I guess we're just a little bit of, uh, ahead of the curve there. And finally, um, there's a huge promise in using the unobtrusive data, the digital exhaust of our digital spaces um, to monitor progress week by week. And other, spe other speakers have spoken to that as well with things like uh, location tracking. Twitter allows us to also do this in the psychological domain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johannes.